Okay, so good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to this morning's debate on cryptocurrency and blockchain, organized by the British Chamber of Commerce's Digital Committee. Um, we're privileged to have an expert lineup for this fascinating and, and really topical discussion. The Chamber holds many topical debates, so I'd just like to remind you first of the next two coming up. Um, on the 6th of May, we're going to hear from Wolfgang Philipp, who is the head of unit for health, security and vaccination. So again, very current, DG Sante on the Health Emergency Response Authority. And on the 3rd of June, we will hear from about the priorities of the S&D group for the post-COVID-19 recovery process. Uh, that's 3rd of June and Pedro Marquez, the S&D vice chair will be leading that debate. So do put them in your diaries. And turning to the subject of today's event, blockchain. The ability of this distributed system to change business processes is phenomenal. Uh, many people think of blockchain as the technology that powers Bitcoin. Uh, and whilst that was its original purpose, its potential and the potential of everything that's built around it is enormous. Uh, blockchain itself could be used to store medical records, to act as a notary, even collect taxes. And this way of recording and tracking anything of value uh, has the potential of revolutionizing the way we interact with one another. But here's the thing. It's transnational in nature and seemingly jurisdictionless. And it offers possibilities of organizing collective governance, but poses challenges to existing governance frameworks, as we know right now. The rise of this new technology brings with it all sorts of complex policy questions, just the kinds of things we in Brussels want to get our, our hands around, around the governance, around security, international law, even taxation. It's if regulation is needed, how do you regulate for innovation and what risks does it bring? It's this intersection of new technology with policy that we're going to explore this morning. Before I start, can I remind everyone that the event is under Chatham House rules? So the, the way we're going to run the event today is I will ask each panelist to speak for between seven and 10 minutes, and then we will have a question and answer session, but please feel free to ask questions as we go along and just pop them into the chat box uh, with your name and your company or your organization. I'll make sure we leave plenty of time for questions at, at the end. Um, and now to our wonderful lineup of speakers. Um, we have Peter Zil Zilgalvis, who is head of unit uh, in DG Connect, responsible for digital innovation and blockchain. We have the Honourable Albert Isola, MP, Gibraltar's Minister for Digital and Financial Services. And we have Andre Kovarik, MEP, and Member of the European Parliament's Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee. Um, unfortunately, our fourth and lady female panellist, as I should say, had to drop out, uh, but we still have a superb lineup. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. So I think let us kick off uh, the today. I think, are we okay, Madeline? Is everybody joined who needs to join? Are we good to go? Yeah, I think we're good to go. Okay, so perhaps I can ask Pateris to, to kick off, if I may. Thank you very much for giving me the floor and the very nice introduction. I'm Peter Zilgalvis, Head of Unit for Digital Innovation and Blockchain and DG Connect, and also Co-Chair of the European Commission's FinTech Task Force, which is relevant for the discussion of the Digital Finance Package, the FinTech Action Plan, and the Markets in Crypto Assets uh, Regulatory Proposal, which I'll raise today. Um, we have a multifaceted strategy and implementation process for blockchain starting with the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which is our think tank. It has reports, workshops, um, deep dives, a community. Please check out the website, the, the Twitter account at EU Blockchain if you want to know more about anything uh, to do with blockchain, for instance, uh, general data protection regulation and blockchain, a recent uh, workshop that we had on central bank digital currencies with the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of Canada. Uh, as is everything these days, it's, it's virtual, so you can join from every, anywhere, from, uh, from the UK, from other parts of the world, from everywhere in Europe. 
Uh, secondly, we have a European blockchain partnership of uh, 29 countries, all EU member states, Norway and Liechtenstein, that are building a European blockchain services infrastructure, building an infrastructure across borders. Uh, this is deploying, this is not piloting. We have use cases, including the very exciting self-sovereign identity, putting the user, the citizen, him or herself in charge of their own identity where they want to manage it. Obviously, this is voluntary. Also, audit document certification, diplomas for people who want to study across borders, uh, move across borders for employment. Also, regulatory reporting, which is extremely important in the financial sector, among other things that we're talking about right now. Uh, Real-time uh, financial reporting made possible, seamless, easier for those being supervised and for the supervisors. This is functioning right now as a regulatory sandbox. These are technologies that are not either foreseen or prohibited. So working through with the member states how we can implement them. The legal part is a, is a big part of the work, including uh, fulfilling existing regulation. It'll be a former a formal uh, regulatory sandbox in the Digital Europe program in the uh, upcoming year with calls for proposals for um, innovators who want to live test along with us their blockchain uh, projects and along with the relevant supervisors for the member states. So we're doing everything to make this a successful ecosystem in the EU while respecting the principle of subsidiarity, for instance. Then we're coming with the legislative proposals, which will probably be part of the discussion today. Uh, the digital finance package, uh, you know, this is a collaborative work, but led by my colleagues in DG FISMA in financial markets, but with my team uh, contributing especially on the legal frameworks for the decentralized uh, digital technologies, uh, the utility tokens aspect especially. And with the markets and crypto assets regulatory proposal, we bring all the crypto assets out of the gray area. Each of them has their regulatory uh, space and each of them is regulated according to the risk. So where there is low risk, light regulation, where there's a higher risk, a higher potential impact on the market or on citizens, then there is more regulation and more supervision. Uh, markets in crypto assets intends to increase legal certainty, support innovation, consumer protection, market integrity, financial stability, and mitigate risks to monetary policy, transmission, and monetary sovereignty. I'm also taking part in the digital euro working groups that we have between the European Commission and the uh, European Central Bank, and an announcement on the next steps, uh, if they are to be taken on the digital euro, can be expected mid-year. We're also active in standardization and skills, and supporting startups in general, for instance, through the Startup Nation's Standard of Excellence, which of course includes blockchain and other deep tech technologies. And finally, finishing my introduction, uh, we have uh, set up an AI and artificial intelligence, which was also mentioned in our, our early discussion, and blockchain investment fund. It was leveraged to 700 million euro in its first year, and we're intending to uh, supplement that funding again to support our blockchain and AI or blockchain or AI startups and scale-ups to become more successful and to find the access to finance that they need. Thanks. Thank you very much. And that was... Uh... Very, very concise. You got a lot in in that time, so thank you for that. Uh, let us move on to Pateris, if you would, if you would uh, join us next. Uh, sorry, Andre. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andre, would you like to join us? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> sorry for that. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, uh, and thank you for for uh, invitation and the possibility. Um, for a uh, discussion on, on this, um, I think, particularly interesting topic. Uh, and also, I think that the, the debate and the timing is, is, uh, is very appropriate as, as we are currently under um, discussions and negotiations within the European Parliament uh, and also I think, on the Council side, um, based on the proposals coming from the European Commission, as, as Peter has as just, uh, uh, just uh, outlined. Um, basically, maybe just uh, very quick uh, overview from the European Parliament side. Um, we have um, 
uh, adopted in the parliament last year and we basically passed uh, the the major major part of 2020 uh, in the European Parliament uh, with our econ colleagues on uh, preparing a report on digital finance as this was, let's say, our, our first um, exercise in, in, order, in order to see where the political groups stand and, and uh, the new parliament where, where it stands uh, in this, in this, uh, on this issue. And I think we, we were able to, um, in the end, uh, adopt uh, by quite the vast majority in the parliament a, a report that is, that is well balanced and has a number of, of um, um, I think, even like political messages uh, on uh, the issues that are very important for, for the parliamentarians. Uh, in terms of uh, future uh, regulatory, but not only regulatory, but also other steps to take uh, in, in the area of, of digital finance. Um, obviously, uh, the one of one of the one of the key uh, aspects was uh, a focus on on the financial sector. But as, as Peter has mentioned, there's there's obviously a lot of uh, possible uh, applications also outside of it, but uh, I think for us the key was to see uh, in, uh, also in, in terms of what um, can be done uh, uh, as a regulatory framework on, on the EU level uh, to focus on, on that. Uh, I think the, there, is, there is a number of, of considerations we also are uh, discussing at this, at this particular point uh, when we negotiate on, on, on the proposals on the European Commission, be it the markets and crypto assets regulation, be it the, the Digital Operational Resilience Act uh, or uh, the DLT pilot regime and other related uh, proposals. I think the key is to uh, first uh, see the, the value added uh, of, the, of the European legislation, which I think is, is uh, um, at least to, to me quite, quite clear uh, in order to avoid um, possible fragmentation of, of markets and, and uh, fragmentation of, of regulatory and supervisory approaches uh, throughout the EU. Um, I think it makes sense to, and it was I think mentioned also at the beginning of, of, the, of, of, of today's uh, discussion, um, the, the, the sense of, um, let's say, international or global uh, dimension, or global uh, nature of of, uh, of uh, digital assets, and I think this is this is important uh, uh, angle to to take into account. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, we also see um, a sort of you know growing markets of of, of uh, various crypto assets and, and digital currencies um, being being uh, promoted and initiated, so starting uh, started by by various stakeholders. And I think that's, that's also a point uh, to see what we can do uh, in, in terms of regulatory framework in, in the EU. Um, what uh, we are trying to achieve, and I think that's it's, uh, sort of our, our com common ambition here, it's uh, to first have uh, a regulatory framework that would guarantee a number of, of safeguards that we, that we usually uh, want to see embedded in, in, especially in the financial uh, financial regulation, the financial type of regulation, um, be it uh, issues linked to the consumers and investors protection, um, uh, links with the uh, possible illicit use, such as the anti-money laundering or, or counter uh, terrorist financing legislation. Um, and th those types of issues also linkage with uh, more traditional uh, financial uh, instruments, which are uh, already regulated under the existing regulation, be it the, the, the MIFID II, be, be it the, the electronic money directive, uh, payment services directive, etc. So to find a sort of a policy coherence, to to make sure that these uh, these principles are sort of part of the of the regulatory framework, but at the same time to keep it open uh, so that it's not uh, uh, sort of limiting. The, especially the, the European uh, business businesses in terms of uh, future innovation, uh, in terms of, of uh, new business models that uh, that may appear, and I think that's that's in my view the, the critical part of, of um, how we how we should uh, approach the, the regulation. Uh, it's it's an extremely fast evolving area. Uh, especially in, uh, when we look at the at the crypto assets and, and the digital currencies um, sector, but at the same time we should be able to uh, come up with a regulation that is that is forward looking, that is that is principle based, that is that is actually able to stay with us for some time, and uh, that is also uh, able to set um, uh, certain standards because as we as we look around globally, 
the, the EU can actually be in the forefront of, of uh, uh, proposing a workable regulatory framework uh, for for uh, crypto assets uh, and and the likes and and to actually show um, what uh, should be the the key components of, of uh, such a regulatory approach and also see uh, what uh, how this can actually impact um, uh, other stakeholders uh, in uh, internationally if we look for example in, in the us or, or in, in asia it's obviously uh, quite a vivid scene of of, uh, of crypto assets and, and uh, also in turn in, in general terms also of, of uh, uh, new fintech uh, uh, companies so i think this is this is something that that uh, can be evaluated uh, from from what we are currently doing in in, in europe um i think uh that, that would be basically a sort of a, a, a scene setter for, for further discussions uh, here. Uh, we are currently, as I said, in the discussions in the committee on, on the parliament's position. We have a draft report from uh, our uh, colleague rapporteur, Stefan Berger, on, on Mika and, and also other files are, are, are being um, uh, drafted. So uh, I think what would be interesting also for me to hear uh, and during the discussion is to is to see um, how uh, you actually view uh, the the area of, of uh, regulatory approach towards crypto assets and and what what may be the the key priorities in in, in your in your view uh, in terms of uh, you know what should be do first uh, in, in order to make sure that the regulatory framework will be um, implementable and something that, that we can actually base our future activities on. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and now I'd like to turn to Gibraltar's Minister for Digital Financial Affairs, um, Albert. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, given the role that Gibraltar plays uh, in, in, as fi in financial services and also gaming, uh, is this a threat? Is this an opportunity? Love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Good morning, Elizabeth. Thank you very much for, for having me on and, and my thanks to the British Chamber of Commerce in Brussels for putting this um, uh, webinar together. Um, I think I'll start by, by thinking, thanking Peter. Um, I've met Peter some years back um, at the very beginning of this process. Um, and I think his vision is very much seen through the MICA uh, uh, paper and all the work that's been done uh, in doing that at a time when we were really calling for a global standard, somebody to lead uh, in terms of the development of the regulatory space uh, around uh, blockchain, DeFi, AI, and everything else that goes with it, including, of course, crypto assets. Um, the Gibraltar journey um, started a very long time ago. Um, 2013, we began to spend some time considering what and how we should be doing, uh, and in, indeed as to whether we wanted to be anywhere near the space. Uh, at that time, the people involved were different. Um, they were opportunists. They weren't people uh, institutionally serious in this technology or in this, or in this uh, uh, business. Uh, and so we set up a working group which, which went through three year period, issuing a number of consultation documents, consulting both internally within Gibraltar and externally, uh, asking ourselves questions like, should we regulate? Can we regulate the technology, the asset, the token? What is it that we can and cannot do? Um, who should be regulating it? Should it be the same regulators of financial services? Should it be a bespoke regulator? Um, and, and we spent an awful lot of time looking at the challenges and the opportunities of the technology, uh, and, and also importantly as to whether we wanted to be anywhere near the space. Money laundering was a key concern. We needed to be satisfied. Uh, before we would agree to go any further, that we could tick that box and ensure that this was not a, a place where that could occur. Um, and so at the end of that process, we then issued a final document which looked at um, the Financial Services Commission as the home, as the competent authority for regulating uh, uh, this the, the, the blockchain space. Uh, and the conclusion of that was that in October of 2017, uh, we published our draft legislation. It came into effect on the 1st of January 2018. Um, so, so for three years now, um, we have had a fully fledged license and supervision system for the blockchain space, um, and which really was the first of its kind in the world. It was innovative, it was creative. And what it sought to do was permit this business to happen safely. 
And by safely is mean in as safe an environment as you can possibly create. And how do we do that? Um, as, as obviously your, your, your listeners will know, this is not a technology which you can box up like you could, for example, Solvency 2 in insurance or MIFID uh, in financial instruments. And so what we did was we, we created what we call the nine core principles. Core principles, which anyone in financial services will be very familiar with. Um, corporate governance, uh, you know, um, uh, capital adequacy, security, um, fitness and propriety. These are all basic principles which anybody in financial services regulation will fully understand. And so we set up these nine core principles um, and we gave the regulator for the first time ever a fair amount of discretion and leeway as to how they implemented those core principles. Why? Because we fully understood that from the first date that these regulations came into force, within six months, if they were fixed and locked in, uh, the technology would have moved on, as indeed it has, and almost rendered the work that we'd done irrelevant. And so these nine core principles gave us uh, uh, the basket which the regulator had available to it to ensure that it was absolutely comfortable uh, with the firms that it was licensing. Gibraltar, as you know, has always been a niche player. We do very well in, in, in narrow and defined markets like online gaming, like blockchain, uh, like specific areas of financial services. Uh, to give you an example, in, in the insurance, in, in motor insurance, we write 25% of the United Kingdom's motor market insurance. That's one in every four cars driving around the UK has got a Gibraltar insurance policy. It's a huge amount for such a small community of people. We are 32,000 people. Um, and our ability to do that is our agility. Um, when we did online gaming 25 years ago, we started it with, without even having the legislation in place. So we regulated by contract. Obviously things have moved on and we're now a fully fledged licensing and regulatory uh, uh, system in place there too. So what we set out to do in blockchain is to enable firms that wanted legal certainty, what Mika uh, 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 is, is one of the objectives of Mika too, um, is to provide firms that want to do this business, to do this from an environment where if they want to do it safely, if they know they're gonna get checked from A to Z in terms of their money laundering processes, the KYC processes, their onboarding processes, all of the traditional financial services basis, uh, then if they came to Gibraltar, they would know full well that we would have that regulatory structure in place. Um, and so today, if you fast forward uh, three years from the 1st of January, 2018, we now have around 15 businesses from all over the world, from, from Asia, from Latin America, from Europe, from the United Kingdom, all working from Gibraltar uh, with mind and management in Gibraltar, fully regulated in the blockchain space. And the work that we're doing now, we have obviously, uh, we were the first jurisdiction to extend POCA, the Proceeds of Crime Act, to issuers of tokens. Why? Because we saw a risk in having people being able to issue tokens without going through the full uh, anti-money laundering uh, uh, process in people buying these tokens. For us, uh, it's about when you enter the system that you've got to be checked uh, in the A to Z uh, um, system. And that's what we did by extending that to, um, to the issuers of tokens. So the system that we have um, with the nine core principles is shortly to be extended to 10 core principles. We always said that as and when things develop, we would react to them. The 10th core principle is on market integrity, market manipulation. And we have a working group that will shortly report back to government. It's a working group with the regulator, with a whole series of private sector firms um, and the government working together to come up with designing this 10th core principle. We've also recently issued an update to our guidance notes to ensure that those remain fit for purpose and are relevant. Um, and we are very much uh, uh, awaiting and looking forward to seeing how NICA develops and the European Commission takes a leading role in the development of a set of international standards, which we very, very much welcome. Uh, we believe that uh, the catalyst for uh, good business in this space is a proper regulatory approach. Um, and so for us, 2024 and Mika can't come soon enough. Uh, we think that will help and support the innovation of this business. Um, I don't believe that institutions will want to come into the space unless it's properly regulated. Uh, and that is a bit of a handbrake in terms of further investment. Um, I would wish the United States uh, would join on and move on from its 1946 highway test and perhaps move a little bit quicker uh, in recognizing some of the core principles that we are discussing here. 
Um, but I think it's an exciting time, full of challenges and full of opportunities. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how that develops. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. So uh, we have heard from our three speakers. So now is the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the chat function um, to ask your question. But before we actually open up to questions from participants, I'd just like to uh, pass over to our CEO of the British Chamber, Dan Dalton, um, for his observations and potentially questions as well. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you to all the speakers for, for very interesting interventions. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the reasons we wanted to do this event is because I think yeah, crypto assets in particular are potentially, you know, transformationary, if you like, for, for the whole system. And uh, part of this is to try and sort of flesh out where do we think, you know, crypto assets are going to go in the future. And I think that's already one of the questions in the chat, um, because people are using them in different ways at the moment. I mean, you see... There's lots of people at the moment using crypto assets effectively as an investment, um, and we can discuss where, you know, whether they're, they're, they're good investments or not. But uh, clearly, it's a, it's a category now for investors, and you even see businesses piling into that. I think we saw Tesla, for example, who, who, who quite, you know, in a big way bought into Bitcoin and sold uh, some of it a month later with a profit, I think, that was more than they'd made selling cars. Um, so I think there's a real sort of investment question here about what's going to happen there but also you know why why is why are crypto assets you know having this sort of big growth uh and what you know what, what's the threat or is there a threat or what's the impact of that in the financial system in 10 15 years time you know are people doing it i've heard many people in the crypto community say you know part of this is an investment uh, is a inflation hedge um because so-called fiat currencies of course have always generally devalued because uh, governments print more money and therefore as a result the value of the the the, the currency is reduced um, but also many people seem to uh, see a future in cryptocurrencies for example in a sort of decentralized global currency almost i think that was part of uh, you know an interesting development there and it'd be interesting to see how particular well, all three of the speakers sort of view that you know where do crypto you know these decentralized crypto assets that theoretically could be used anywhere in the world fit in 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 the system at the moment but also because there's different roles for different types of crypto so of course bitcoin has a very different role in the ecosystem to ethereum for example and, and where is that going to develop we see new ones coming in all the time that are, that are seeking to do different roles and um uh, all of these are open questions which ties me just to, to my last point on on this is and my real question is, where do the central bank digital currencies fit into this? Because I think there's a huge, yeah, you know, there's lots of really interesting ways that they could develop. And um, one of these is potentially, and we've heard some discussion of this in the UK, that uh, a central bank issued digital currency could actually allow um, people to lodge their assets directly with the central bank rather than through an intermediate financial institution, which happens at the moment. Um, and so I, for me, I just put all those questions out. They'd be very interested to see what the panelists and, and, and what other participants have to say on any of these, uh, these things. But uh, thank you all for, for being here. And I think we're gonna have a very good discussion. Thank you, Dan. Well, I think um, perhaps I will ask our three uh, speakers who would like to take Dan's uh, observations and questions first. Um, I can I can say something from from my side. As I said, I'm you. involved in our discussions of uh, the working groups of the European Commission and the European Central Bank on the on the digital euro. But it's not coming from that process, but from Mika itself. That Mika does not cover the European Central Bank and does not cover a digital euro or a central bank digital currency. It covers a the stablecoin area asset reference tokens, uh, globally significant asset reference tokens that could implement a similar um, place in the uh, digital currency ecosystem, depending on how they develop and how they're used. Um, but so this will be uh, a different beast. The central bank digital currency will be legal tender, like today's euro or dollar or yen or won. Uh, China looks like they, they might be the first. 
And then on the other questions, just a little bit more philosophically, um, the cryptocurrencies, the digital currencies, e-money tokens, uh, utility tokens, the different areas that we address in uh, markets and crypto assets, along with the security tokens, which stay under MIFID, um, are all, I think, very uh, strong potential offerings in the market. Uh, for individuals, for companies, for startups to be able to manage their investments, their payments, um, other, uh, other processes that they want to handle themselves. And it's also an exciting area that people can invent their own crypto asset to meet the needs, the either investment needs, if it's a security token, uh, payment needs, if it's an e-money token, a utility token to run a decentralized uh, digital ecosystem, which was the thing that particularly my side of the commission was contributing to the legislative proposal that we want to make sure that these uh, smart contracts, other applications on blockchains, distributed ledger technologies, future decentralized technologies can be used to the, the full of their potential in Europe to manage data, to manage processes, coordination, quantify climate change, for instance. And there, there's a lot of potential here. Obviously, as with any technology, it can be misused. So there are risks with anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing. We have laws in place, legal frameworks. Um, Mika also has a, very much a, a stringent set of requirements if you do want to open an exchange, et cetera, in, in Europe, which again, it needs to be there. We underline the consumer protection along with the freedom. But I mean, one of the things that I've always found amazing about uh, the framework of EU law, different from international law, that individuals, that companies can uh, ask for their rights to be enforced directly and also subsidiarity. So I think this fits in very nicely with our multi-level governance, giving control to the individual, to the company, uh, as long as they're operating within the law, they're protecting the consumer. Um, we have sustainability issues with, uh, with proof of work, but an amazing opportunity for the innovation principle for innovation to flourish within a clear regulatory framework, no gray areas, um, protection for the consumer, but at the same time, a very open market for novelty, for creativity, for innovation. Hmm. Andre, do you want to pick up on that? Yes, indeed, and, and thanks for, for the question. I think uh, it's actually, um, I think, in, in the core of the considerations that, that we, we, we were having here around the, um, around the crypto assets. Um, uh, well, first of all, I think, uh, to follow up to what uh, Petr has just said, uh, I think the the CBDCs, uh, the, the the central bank digital currencies, even though if, you know they are not part of, of, of the of regulatory framework as we discussed today, they they are actually are part of the equation um, uh, when when we look at the uh, the landscape, and um, um, we may not be at this point uh, that much advanced, but uh, I think uh, uh, the CBDCs in the future they will have to role, uh, they will have a role to play. Uh, in sort of counterbalancing uh, the the privately initiated or privately run uh, projects, uh, stable coins, so whatever we would uh, we would call them. Um, I think uh, one of the one of the key uh, factors of why uh, the the discussion on on cryptocurrencies is 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 being actually advanced in Europe is is also, for instance, the the project of, of uh, launched uh, of, of um, a private stablecoin backed by Facebook and other companies called the DM or the former Libra, and I think this this is this is uh, exactly the example of of initiative that can actually have an impact in terms of of uh, providing new types of business models in payment services, financial services, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And coming coming from from the Let's say central bank side, uh, the CBDCs would be would be uh, a, a, in, in terms of, uh, of of the functions would be a match to 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 those privately uh, uh, initiated uh, stablecoins. And I think also if you look in the future, and I think uh, there was there was one of the questions in the chat, and also what, what, what Dan asked about this, um, you know what what this can actually mean in, in future. And I believe that 
if we look at the cryptocurrencies, the crypto assets uh, right now, but at the same time, if we look at the CBDCs, those are actually um, a potential new factors for further innovation. Uh, if you if you have a digital euro or digital pound, or in, in Sweden they have digital uh, e corona, um, if if this is if this is actually run and initiated uh, in, in in the real economy. Uh, you will immediately have a number of, of companies that can actually take it as, as a starting point, point for further innovation. They can actually elaborate based on that completely new business models, which are uh, at this point uh, not possible with, uh, with the regular fiat currencies or the cryptocurrencies as we, as we know them. And I think there is, there is actually an incredible potential in, in, in innovation in this regard. And that, that's why I think that, uh, that it would be important to, uh, to uh, uh, promote them. Uh, in terms of the future of crypto assets, obviously we see now surge in a number of them. We see we see volatility uh, in markets, um, but at the same time, I think if we look in the, in the entire landscape of, of various financial uh, instruments that we have, um, the, the the market capitalization of, of crypto assets, even those the the most important ones. Uh, are still um, not that significant compared to other uh, other instruments that that, that we have, um, but I think um, as as it was mentioned at, at the same time the crypto assets are uh, a, a reaction to very low interest uh, rate uh, economy the, the environment that we are currently experiencing the the potential inflation risks it was mentioned as well and I think in terms of of uh, let's say future. Um, uh, introduction of, of crypto assets into uh, the regular financial services as we know them. Uh, this, this is also one of the aspects that can actually help to evaluate the, uh, the, 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 the crypto assets uh, as, as, uh, as we can see, for example, right now with Bitcoin in terms of, for example, having crypto assets as part of regular portfolios of, of uh, banks or asset managers uh, in order to create uh, potential for, for fire growth um, in um, various financial instruments that they they are um, uh, managing. So I think there there is there is potential for for crypto assets to, to enter uh, in, into the zone. But I'm not exactly sure whether the crypto assets. If if you look at ten years back, what the Bitcoin was, you know, challenging the monetary system of of, uh, um, of you know given the financial crisis, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I'm I'm not really sure that this is this is where where we're heading. But um, we're definitely heading into a, a digital and, and uh, like sort of a borderless uh, uh, future of, of, of uh, using currencies and of, of uh, actually providing and consuming uh, financial services. Thank you. And Albert, I'm just interested from the kind of vantage point of, of Gibraltar uh, and this, uh, this borderless, um, which is quite <laughs> interesting in the context that we're all living in today, a uh, view of how cryptocurrencies can be used and the kind of innovative approach that Gibraltar has taken thus far. Would you agree with what our previous speakers have to say? I would, yes. I mean, I, I, I think that we're, we're talking about a number of different things at the same time, um, and, and they're quite different. Uh, if you look at what happened in 2017, when there was a boom of tokens, um, where there was a mad rush people literally borrowing money to buy tokens. There was just madness in the market uh, in an unregulated space uh, where there was no control, there was no AML process, there was no consumer protection. It was just almost like the Wild West. And that had the impact of severely uh, damaging the reputation of tokens, unfortunately, uh, which were a wonderful source of uh, uh, startup capital for many of the businesses that were getting into this area. Uh, and that was, uh, in my view, a shame and, and almost a lost opportunity. But it's almost the pain you had to go through uh, to begin to develop the thinking that we're talking about now in terms of having a regulatory approach for all of these areas to ensure that the consumer has the freedom uh, to make those investments, but at the same time with a, a basic uh, level of protection that there are regulations in place to protect that consumer uh, so that the risk is only the risk of the business and not other things, which have been the risk in the past. Um, so so from, from my perspective, um, I think the tokens have a, a, an enormous uh, um, use and, and advantage in the, in the future digital world that we're going to live in. Um, and I think perhaps bigger than we can imagine at this moment in time. Um, when you then start talking about CBDCs, it's almost a reaction to the digital token. 
um, and, and there are now over 60 countries that are considering CBDC. And, and when I noticed, or when I saw two weeks ago, the Bank of England and Her Majesty's Treasury Department uh, issuing a statement uh, that they are now looking at it um, with one of the four stated objectives being to ensure that in effect they remain relevant uh, in the area of, of financial uh, global innovation. It tells you that this is serious and this is coming and here to stay. And I'm interested in what Peter said that there, there would be a, um, a statement made in Brussels in the coming months. Uh, I, I think this is the way forward. And, and what we're basically doing is facilitating the new world of digital finance. So smart contracts and how those can be used more effectively and efficiently. Um, payment systems, uh, e-money, tokens. We're talking about a whole range of different uh, uh, things that all have the same purpose. Are these by themselves investable? Well, we've all seen the huge volatility that these uh, have. And, and uh, let's be clear, if there are 100 tokens today, we all know that there'll probably be 10 left in, in three or five years time. Many will go, uh, but that's the market forces and that's market risk. Uh, you can't blame anyone for that. Some will do better than others. That's the normal, the normal uh, harsh reality of commercial life. So that is not a detractor. That is innovation at its best. Um, if you look back at all the startups in the, in the, in the dot-com uh, bubble, we've today got four of the largest five companies are tech companies, but there were many others that didn't quite make it. Again, that's normal. So that shouldn't be anything that should worry us. Um, so so I, I think it's, it's, it's a very, um, I think it's a very exciting time. I, I think the CBDCs will take us to the next level. I think that Andre mentioned Diem or, or, or the former Libra. Just imagine a, a, a business uh, which has the ability to, to access 3 billion customers uh, in one go and start enabling them to move money. If that doesn't shake uh, financial uh, systems and regulators around the world, I don't know what will. So uh, the questions are coming in fast and furious. A number of them, and I've had some texts as well, um, that all ask a similar type of question, which I think I'm going to come to you again, Albert, first this time, because Gibraltar has instigated a regulatory framework. You talked about the nine principles, soon to be 10. Uh, lots of questions around the relationship between regulation and innovation, regulation and growth. Um, I will, I'd like, I, I'd like all three of you to maybe comment on this, um, maybe respond to one another. But, you know, there is always the concern that once you regulate, then you potentially stifle innovation. Um, and, um, you know, that is a constant tension in the in the EU. So I, I'd like to come to you first, Albert, to see how you, you, you seem to have managed to navigate around that. Um, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see, to reflect on how that's been successful to you and, you know, how, how the EU is looking at this. And then maybe both to, to Peteris and Andre for your comments on that tension. Um, I, I mentioned in my introduction um, that agility is a strength that we enjoy because we're so small. Um, you know, Andre and Peteris can't do the work, things in the way that we do, we are th a very, very small jurisdiction. And so the biggest strength we have is that when we started this process, we sat around a table with a government, with a regulator, and with the specialists in the private sector. It's in effect what a think tank, a think tank does uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, the difference with us is that we're able to take firsthand what are the measures that we should be doing to do things safely. Um, and there, there is some, some I, I wouldn't call it friction, but some good interaction with the private sector, um, because obviously they are pulling to be able to do business. We want them to be able to do business, but we want them to be able to do it safely. And we don't want consumers uh, to be impacted negatively, which could have a negative impact on the jurisdiction uh, and its reputation. And so how do you marry those things together? Well, I think that it's only by talking uh, and it's by extensive uh, uh, discussion that you don't kill innovation by regulation. And so you have to take a pragmatic approach, you have to be sensible, you have to be proportionate, and you have to be reasonable. And I think if, if you were to speak to any of the 15 businesses that NGIP are regulated today by the Financial Services Commission there, I think they would all tell you that we've achieved that. We've achieved proportionality, because if you've got a problem, the first person you pick up is a regulator and say, I've got this issue, how can I get round? And they will sit with you and talk you through how they believe you need to deal with it to ensure that you don't come a cropper in terms of how they will perceive if they hear about it later. 
So it's that interaction which we've been working very hard to encourage and to foster. Um, and from, from where I'm sitting, we do that now in other areas of financial services, having learned from the blockchain experience. So the interaction between licensed firms and GIP, whether it's in insurance, whether it's in wealth management, whether it's in MIFID, um, is very much closer now as a result of that approach. It benefits both sides, it really does. And, and uh, if, if, as long as you maintain that proportionality, I think you're able to get somewhere which is safe and proportionate and not what people fear, which is over-regulation. I'm, I'm happy to come in on, on my side as well. I mean, uh, we've been following this, you can say, for uh, a very long time. Uh, at least since uh, 2012 in the commission and myself, I got very in-depth into the world of uh, blockchain. And when I was a visiting uh, senior fellow at uh, St. Anthony's College at the University of Oxford, 2013, 2014, looking very much at the FinTech ecosystem, the beginning of what became Project Innovate and the um, Financial Conduct Authority, which led to the first regulatory sandbox and published and studied it. And there were other colleagues in financial markets in the commission that I, that I talked to. So if it was ever true that if it moves, the European Commission regulates it, this was not the case. Uh, we also set up with the European Parliament together, the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum, which I mentioned, which had a certain focus also at the beginning, uh, sometimes on the cryptocurrencies, because this was the hot thing, uh, 2016, 2017, the ICOs. So also to give us more statistics, in-depth analysis, but something that in both formal public consultations and informal discussions with stakeholders, like something like what, what we're doing today, uh, what we were getting as feedback almost without cease was that we want this to be a regulated area. We don't want to be in a gray zone where perhaps we can't open bank accounts, where we cannot get legitimate investors to look at us. We can't rent offices possibly because we're some kind of fly-by-night semi-illegal operation, even if it was not something that was against a, a concrete law. And then obviously there were cases of fraud. There were areas of incompetence like in any other area of business, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. The statistics don't seem to show that it's a, a much worse area for, for anti-money laundering than other areas, for instance. Um, so then when we did move on with the FinTech action plan, with the first steps, the FinTech uh, task force, to seeing the potential and also risks of digital assets, it was a process that, again, went through the whole better regulation, public consultations, impact assessment analysis. Before we moved in, we were we had to be very sure that this was something that would help the ecosystem, that would help innovation at the same time for the higher risk areas, addressing the risk. So it was a, a thought out process, a process very much in hand in hand with the stakeholders. And in the end, if you look globally, I mean, all, all credit to uh, how to say the great uh, regulatory innovation of Gibraltar and some, some other smaller jurisdictions that you know, obviously can, can move faster. And uh, I'd say this is, this is only, only great. Um, we are actually probably the first major jurisdiction in the world um, that have moved with a comprehensive approach to all the different types of crypto assets, digital assets. Um, hopefully, and that, that's what I'm very happy also to hear from, from next. This will move uh, quickly uh, still through the, uh, the European Parliament and the Council, which is, uh, how to say, an uh, essential part of our democratic system. And then we'll have something that can be implemented to have, I mean, real uh, sustainable investment utilizing these tools to help our startups, to help small and medium enterprises. We see that some, some big companies are getting involved and when uh, individual investors also can be informed, can benefit from transparency, they can see what the opportunities or the risks or the downfalls of investing in this market as opposed to other markets are. And I think most importantly, from my perspective, uh, utilizing this technology with tools like the smart contracts, self-sovereign identity, decentralized systems to really give citizens more control over their own data, over their own credentials, not having them always being uh, 
controlled by a large private entity or in cases where it's not needed by a governmental entity, but letting people move seamlessly on the internet through their lives digitally and feeling and then actually being in control of their own digital destiny and digital choices. Andre, do you share that vision? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, absolutely. I think to 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 a large extent, uh, I would subscribe to what has been just said. Um, I mean, just in terms of uh, because Peter is alluded to the fact that we are currently uh, working on those proposals. Uh, uh, I agree that you know we we need to uh, progress fast, also in terms of preparing the regulation. But I always said that you know. Um, as we are actually entering an uncharted territory, and this is, you know, the very first time we're trying to sort of establish such a uh, such a um, uh, type of uh, regulation in of, of crypto assets, I think the you know the, the quality should should matter uh, before before the the speed, and I and I really think that we, we should we should um, because. I, now we have the possibility to get it right. If we, if we, if we really do it right, then then we have uh, we have uh, you know we can meet the ambition as, as it was mentioned to to set set the international standards, but also to create a predictable, stable uh, regulatory environment for um, for companies and and uh, for, for businesses to innovate. Not only the Europeans, but also to attract uh, those companies that are actually maybe working in the area currently in other jurisdictions. So I think this is uh, this is an important. Uh, important point I wanted to make, but otherwise I, I, I fully agree with the fact that um, uh, it is actually uh, an important step to to introduce a, a regulatory framework in, in, in this in this area, because uh, as um, let's say the interest of, of companies, but also citizens of potential retail investors and and uh, supervisors is actually. Uh, is still more and more focusing on, on those types of, of, of assets and new instruments. Um, and, and also from the point of view of those who are actually running and trying to, trying to promote in these, uh, these innovations, uh, it is important that they are uh, sort of on, on an equal footing with, uh, with uh, let's say, traditional instruments that are already existing. And um, this, is, uh, this is, I think, the, the, the important step uh, that, that we, have to, we have to take in order to sort of make sure that uh, possible articulation between the existing financial sector and the existing financial services as they are provided together with uh, any type of innovative approaches be, be it you know uh, built on, on blockchain smart contracts uh, or the tokenization then it's, it's actually still a uh, legitimate and legal uh, way how to how to co cooperate together and I think it's it's also if you if you look at uh, not only in fintech scene but if you look at also what we call the or some sometimes it's called the, the legacy financial institutions such as banks or or, um, yeah. or uh, the, the insurance companies or, or um, the investment uh, asset managers you, you can you can really see a huge interest also from from their side in order to create and and actually uh, initiate projects that would uh, sort of bring them uh, closer to to those who, who are interested in, um, in in the in the innovative approaches. So I think I think there is there is a mutual there is a mutual interest in, in having a good regulatory framework in place. And, and uh, uh, I'm really uh, I'm really go, uh, happy that we can actually make this step forward. And I'm really confident that uh, this this can actually be a, a, a very good step forward for for Europe as well. I don't actually, I don't have the guest list in front of me, so I don't know if there's anybody from the so-called legacy financial institutions uh, participating, but if they are and would like to take the floor, would you make yourself known to me or put yourself in the chat? It would be very interesting to hear what uh, banks, for example, are, are, are thinking about in this whole area. Um, I would actually like to, to you mentioned, Andre, uh, contracts, smart contracts. We've had several questions on, uh, on smart contracts. Uh, one of them from Harry Bridge uh, from CPI, who asked how important are they, how are they being utilised and what value do you see for them moving forward? And Elisabetta asks also about current protections for consumers who enter into contracts. Redress, so that kind of a more general question around redress uh, uh, mechanisms and so on. So um, I think let's, let's move on to the, the, 
the kind of nuts and bolts of contracts and smart contracts? Who would like to take that first? I can attempt a, uh, <laughs> I just say, simple, simple explanation, and then this always has the danger of either being too simple or or too complicated. But um, we started, you can say, in this field with with Bitcoin, which uh, for various reasons to me seems like uh, like old software today in terms of energy use. Um, but at the time of 2009, when uh, whoever, whoever, Satoshi you know, Nakamoto and whichever people they are, came out with this vision, it was a really amazing proof of concept, how to prevent a double spend and to have this electronic money that didn't need a centralized authority controlling it, governance by the users. Um, but basically what you can do with a Bitcoin is send a Bitcoin back and forth and spend it. So then you got the vision coming of Ethereum and the founders of Ethereum of making a Turing complete, a world computer, a blockchain that could be programmed to do anything. And then this in effect is the smart contract. You can take some example like, uh, I want to sell this financial instrument if such and such different parameters are reached, price or trading volume, et cetera, et cetera. You can make it as simple or as complicated as you want. And then I want the, uh, I'd say if this we're talking about uh, either Ethereum or we're talking about Bitcoin, it should be transferred there and there. So this is my maybe a lawyer's <laughs> uh, explanation of the programming, but it's a way to make the blockchain do all different kinds of things. Um, again, this can be a legal contract. It doesn't have to be a legal contract. It's basically software to do something in an automated, automated way that has been agreed upon. So this has, I mean, to my mind and in our reading, um, an incredible amount of potential use cases from all kinds of things like supply chain, uh, climate impact quantification, um, possibilities for data to receive an order to be erased at a time when that data is no longer relevant. Um, so I think things that, again, put people who have either the programming tools themselves or, you know, for those like, like me and others who are probably not going to be massively programming smart contracts can make use of what's on the market to fulfill needs, to subscribe to things, to participate in a decentralized system. So hopefully that was simple enough and, and at the same time uh, encompassing enough to, to give an idea of uh, the potential of this tool. Would anybody else like to come in before we move on yes, to the next one? Yes, I please. I, I think the, the idea of software developers writing contracts instead of lawyers is an interesting one. Um, and I think that, that, that smart contracts really do have a, a very, very uh, exciting role to play in, in the future. Uh, just, you, you can imagine the use cases, you know, insurance contracts, which are automated in terms of a claim, the speed, the cost of, of dealing with these things. So there's no question that smart contracts are going to have a, an increasing role. But if we look at where we are now and where we've come from, uh, in terms of the development of the digital currency, which is what we're going to be using to pay, uh, I think we've got a little bit longer to wait for the for the for the uh, smart contract to evolve, for people to understand it and have confidence in using it. So I think it's an exciting uh, uh, tool. It's already there, but in in a way which needs mass adoption, and that's going to take a considerable period of time, in my view. Uh, even though it's already in use today, uh, so I think it'll come, but but I think it'll be a little a little bit of a while longer. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to maybe move on to well, we, you you've all talked about it one way or another the role uh, the the risks of of kind of criminal activity and uh, we have one particular question on AML from Tanga and I, I apologise if I mispronounce your name Tanga von Van Overstraten uh, who's from Link Laces I can get the company like the organisation right or the law firm right at least <laughs> uh, and Tanga asks uh, whether uh, any of you would see a way of increasing cooperation between the EU and local financial uh, uh, and data protection regulators 
to ensure that, uh, to make sure that financial frauds can be effectively uh, prevented. And of course, he uh, mentioning uh, the compliance with him and compliance with GDPR. So would love to have your thoughts on that. Um, please, whoever would like to, to kick off on that one. AML and how you increase cooperation between EU and local uh, 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 regulators. Uh, yeah. Please, Andre. I think you're. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. No, I think um, that's uh, it's a very good question and, and, and very important one because we obviously and um, sort of alluded to it uh, at the beginning uh, when you know commenting on, on the reasons why we need to, uh, uh, a common regulatory framework. I think uh, what we can see, and this is also maybe Patrice can give us some more details, but uh, this is what we are also expecting from. Uh, uh, the upcoming proposal on the um, update of, of uh, the European anti-money laundering uh, rules uh, later this year, uh, where, where we, uh, for example, in, in the Parliament, we asked uh, for for a change of, of legal basis to have a, to have a regulation so that we have you know unique set of rules um, uh, over over the European uh, Union, so so that EU twenty seven has sort of a, a common understanding of. of uh, uh, the uh, the risks and, and challenges and that also uh, the action to be done in terms of uh, fighting uh, money laundering and, and what it, what has to be what has to be uh, adopted it, it is it is true and I and I, it's also one of the ambitions uh, from my side in, in, into the new uh, Mika uh, and, and and other regulations I think we, we really need to t talk seriously about um, a sort of a supervisory harmonization because uh, what we can see is is you know, with various supervisors uh, implementing various rules uh, in various different ways, which becomes in, in the end an obstacle for uh, uh, companies to, to scale up over, over the European uh, market. And I think this is also, it, it should be not only in the interest of, of supervisors in order to have a sort of more unified approach that can actually help uh, track and, uh, and monitor uh, those kind of activities that, that can be considered illicit across borders, but also in terms of, of uh, uh, providing more innovative potential for, for companies, especially when we, when we speak about cross-border cross activities, because uh, um, if we want it or not, at, at this point, there's, there's a lot of actually problems uh, lying in the fact that uh, there, is a, there's, there is a difference in supervisory practice uh, across, across various member states, and, and the, the, the companies need to meet uh, different requirements when uh, when entering uh, um, a different different market, and and in this in this regard, uh, uh, let me just drop one one thought that I'm, I'm, I'm I, I, I like mentioning uh, when we speak about supervisors and regulators. Uh, we speak about how technology can actually enhance uh, the potential of businesses. How can it how can it enhance uh, our experience as customers, as clients? You know what what, what the, the, can technology can bring into um, into business relations. But I think. Uh, there is already an existing and growing area of, of uh, uh, supervisory technology, for instance, that, that can be adopted uh, by, uh, by the supervisors themselves. And um, there are already uh, some good examples in, in practice when, uh, you know, we, we were talking about smart contracts, you know, how they can actually uh, automate some kind of uh, uh, relations in, in, in the business, uh, business practice. But we can have uh, much more automated um, uh, let's say relations in terms of uh, supervisory uh, tasks that, that that has to be done. So many companies, you know, are are uh, complaining about uh, the administrative burden linked to the reporting uh, requirements and, and other issues. And there is actually a lot that can be that can be done if we make use properly of technology, both on the supervisors and the business side. And I think this is uh, this should be this should be our uh, one of our goals in, in Europe in order to uh, make sure that. You know, we are not only digitalizing the economy itself, but we are also digitalizing the the, the public side of it. And and the, the because without that, we, we can still be sort of missing uh, and not tapping the fully the potential that uh, that uh, the uptake of digital technologies can have, including uh, you know, technologies that we're discussing today, such as blockchain or AI. I I, I think um, Andre is um, absolutely right, and I agree entirely with everything he's just said. I think that in this space, um, there is a huge advantage in dealing with it, with anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorist financing, which we don't have in the traditional systems. And that is the use of the technology itself, which is hugely powerful, 
to support police authorities, regulators uh, in scrutinizing uh, precisely what happens on the, on the, on the blockchain. And so uh, in Gibraltar, I can tell you that last week we should a press uh, release because we've just contracted a private sector firm to provide precisely this service to our regulators, to our financial intelligence unit, um, in order that they have the latest tools available to uh, assist them in, in, in the fight against crime. Um, and it's the use of technology in interpreting, for example, the suspicious transactions, the suspicious activity reports that the intelligence units receive. Um, and, and, and I think that it's going to be very, very powerful. It's far, far easier um, to fight crime on the blockchain than in the traditional uh, uh, spaces. And so I think we should be in a much better place using the technology itself to support uh, the, 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 the efforts of our respective law enforcement services and regulators to fight crime specifically in this space. How quite that fits in, in GDPR, unfortunately, as you will know, we were very reluctant leavers of, of the European Union um, a couple of years back. Um, and, and I don't quite know uh, where that will sit in terms of the, the interrelationship between information. We still, through our financial intelligence unit, supply information to all the European countries uh, as we did before. Uh, and that will carry on in terms of the suspicious activity reports that we receive, we pass them on to the respective countries. Um, and, and I hope that that will continue. I mean, I can uh, only agree with, uh, with the two statements that have just been made. And I can't, uh, how to say, shine any extra light on the uh, pragmatic day-to-day -day collaboration between the Commission's AL AML colleagues who are in the financial markets and their national colleagues, though I'm sure that through the, uh, through the governmental committees, I mean, this work does go on. Uh, also underlining that there are exceptional possibilities here on reg tech and supervisory tech giving tools as well to the supervisors, to the regulators, to ensure that illicit activities uh, can be uh, contained as, as, as much as possible. And then maybe the last comment, uh, which is something that I encounter because I'm in the situation of being uh, a builder, you can say, with the European blockchain services infrastructure along with the 29 countries and being in this perspective also with the digital euro so if there was the choice to build it, how to find the balance between the legitimate interests of fighting money laundering, terrorist financing, and privacy. And you see more and more between these uh, legitimate interests, which in a principle, in a, in a legal system, a democratic legal system like ours, need to be balanced. Uh, they can be both implemented, but at some point they come at, they come at cross purposes. And you do see a certain polarization between people in the uh, data protection community who want complete privacy, complete erasure, um, including in areas sometimes like the financial services and the very legitimate interests of ensuring that uh, dirty money, that money laundering is not happening, that terrorist organizations are not receiving money. So we can build in, I mean, I have this not unique, but perhaps not so often seen a uh, perspective that I'm working on the legal instruments. And then also I have the perspective of a, of a public or pub, uh, private service, also a private sector builder that the software and the machine, you can say to give it that a moniker can be designed in many ways, but we have to find out what exactly the balance is that is demanded in relation to new technologies in general. This is also to artificial intelligence, decentralized artificial intelligence. And this is very interesting, but in some ways not, not such an easy process. And you do have some voices in the debate that are very polarized, either wanting to see everything or wanting no one to see anything. And then those two ends of the debate are probably not reconcilable. Um, I don't know if Andre, you wanted to respond before we move on. No? Okay. Um, 
I would like actually to leave a little bit of time to actually talk about the blockchain itself. And there are a few questions there. But before we move back, move on to that, there are uh, several questions on the CBDC. And for those of you who don't know what CB CBDC is, it's Central Bank Digital Cur Currency. Um, we have several questions from there. One from Kilian Book, who uh, uh, is from the House of Commons, he's the Parliament representative to the EU, and Kilian asks, um, on these CBDCs, is the EU, is the European Central Bank open to the possibility of self-custody? Um, and there he uh, asks so that consumers can hold them in their private digital wallets that are not through a bank um, and use CBDC to provide liquidity. Um, so that's one question. And the other question I wanted to also pose at the same time is the one from Ronald Terrazas. And Ronald is from the Polish Academy of Sciences. And Ronald asks whether the, you can, uh, how compatible the CBDC is with the fiat currency. So who would like to take that? I can, I can answer very quickly that no, well, first of all, the decision on whether to have the digital euro hasn't been taken. I, I obviously can't uh, uh, comment uh, so much in any detail on the Chinese digital yuan or the possible digital dollar, et cetera, Bermuda sand dollar, among others. Uh, architectural decisions, so have not been taken either. Obviously, many different options are, are being looked at. Uh, the European Central Bank even has done some, some testing. Uh, but this is this is all open. So really what will come, there will be a decision on whether to move with the so-called experimentation phase in the middle of the year, and then work in earnest on the different architectural options, account-based, token-based, uh, DLT-based, uh, on the payment rails of today, I mean, will be, will be eventually taken. This will not be taken from point zero. A lot of thinking, a lot of people are working, but looking at all the different options. So all the different options are on the table. And of course, underlining very politically, <laughs> this yes, yes or no, or later decision has to be taken before, before anything like that uh, happens. And um, yes, I mean, in a European Union context, uh, most likely this would uh, require a legislative proposal. Um, it's not very clear that Article 128, which is the one on um, on the euro as uh, as banknotes and coins, would cover the the digital euro. I mean, this is again, it's also a big political decision. So you could expect if these following decisions are taken that there could be a legislative proposal coming from the European Commission. But again, these things need to be formally decided. I've actually got a few more questions that have come in on this, on the, uh, on this, this as well, on CBDCs. Um, and actually, I think uh, before Albert, you answer, maybe I should uh, ask the question from Paul. Uh, Paul Estengo from the government of Gibraltar, who asks whether uh, one, who asks if one of the significant benefits of a CBDC would be clear oversight of how the money is being utilised before removing the illicit use of cash. So going back, I think also to our previous discussion. I wonder if Albert, you have uh, some comments on that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know quite how much people would like to have that. Um, but but uh, I think if you look at di different digital currencies in different parts of the world, that may be an objective in some and not in others. Um, I, I think if you go back to the point that Andre made um, some time back uh, about, it's not a problem to take time to get things right. Uh, and, and I think that's absolutely right. And I think that the measured manner in which uh, Mika has been developed, and I'm sure similarly, the CBDC in the European Union and other countries will be developed, uh, certainly in the UK, from the papers I've seen from two weeks back, this is going to take time. This is a this is a, an enormous step. Um, we haven't had a, a a central bank issue a new currency for, for 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 many many hundreds of years, and to suddenly think that we're going to leap into issuing a, dig, a new digital form of, of currency uh, can be done quickly is is I think uh, is I think not realistic. And so this is going to take time, and I think it's important that it does take time. Uh, we talk about <laughs> systemic risk in the financial markets. Well, if we get this one wrong, that's one heck of a systemic risk. And consequently, I would, I would certainly um, 
alert and, and support uh, time being taken to get these things right. Um, I think a lot more will be learned in the intervening period through the issuance of stable coins and other tokens that we can see how those move and how those operate before we begin to think of the impact that these could possibly have uh, on, on countries and their own digital uh, currency. So um, I, 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 would, I, would, uh, I would certainly uh, urge caution in terms of not rushing in to get this uh, anything other than right. Please if I may just, yeah, thank you. If I may just quickly, um, I, I, I agree with the, you know, the, the need to be cautious and, and, and I'm really glad that the, uh, the ECB uh, uh, is, is actually uh, currently exploring the possibilities. Uh, at the same time, uh, I know that, you know, they're, they're testing uh, various, uh, various scenarios, uh, but there was a, a quite an interesting public consultation done by, by ECB on, on, you know, what, what the, um, the citizens, the businesses actually think about the potential uh, benefits or, or, or potential problems linked to, linked to the, the, the introduction of, current, uh, of the digital euro. And I think for, if, if we are talk, if you are about to have the you know the political discussion, as Matthias mentioned, and I think he's completely right, this this would be a a, a political a political decision to make in the end. Uh, but um, I think it is important to see that uh, there is uh, there is an appetite for for a, a digital representation of of, of uh, the, the currency, but at the same time, it, it's it's not at this point viewed as something. Uh, completely replacing uh, the cash as we know it today. It's more like as, as a complement. And um, this is also what I meant by saying, you know, if you introduce a new representation of, of, of the currency, we can actually create the entire ecosystem, uh, the new ecosystem for, for innovation, but it's not, you know, about scrapping the, the existing one. And I think this, is, this was something that was, was very important. And also uh, uh, to link to your question, uh, there, there is a, there's a, a huge importance that uh, at least those who replied to the public consultation uh, paid to the, 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 the fact that uh, any uh, digital representation of the currency would have to uh, comply with uh, very strict rules uh, regarding privacy and security. So these, these are, these are I think, the, 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 very, um, the most important concerns that, that were raised in, in this regard. And I think uh, this, this uh, would sort of, uh, in be a, a valuable input uh, in, into further work, uh, especially when we discuss uh, uh, digital euro. I think as, as Albert mentioned, there, there can be some other uh, digital uh, central bank currencies which may not have these uh, concerns uh, taken on board fully, but, uh, but I think if we discuss uh, uh, about the central, central bank currencies across the EU, this, this would be an important uh, point to, to raise. I've had a, a couple of questions actually coming in about, um, you know, does this, it, can we see the end to cash? Um, you know, can we see, although it's slowly, slowly, carefully as you go, could you foresee, envisage in a generation that there will no longer be the need for cash and that you have a much, uh, much more effective and efficient system? Um, I, I, can't, I can't see that. I can see less and less cash being used but I can't ever see the elimination of cash. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, strengths of this technology is of course, banking the unbanked. Uh, people that have had no choice but to be in cash because they're not able to open an account anywhere. There are many parts of the world uh, where this uh, is a real problem, uh, whether it's Latin America, whether it's Africa. Uh, and so the ability to have this technology with your wallets on your phone uh, is suddenly banking the unbanked, not in the traditional way. Uh, and so, so I, I think there are many countries that are going to skip the bank and go straight to the digital uh, uh, wallets. But I don't think that will lead to the elimination of cash altogether. Um, and I don't think it has to. There's a need to eliminate cash. Um, but certainly its usage as it is today, cash was used much more five years ago than it was today, and 10 years ago than it is today. And I think in five years' time, it'll be very much the same. That trend will continue. Uh, but I don't believe there's a need for it to, to be eliminated now. But actually, that's, it kind of leads to a, a question which comes actually also from Harry Bridge, but I think it's an important question about the potential of, of these, these currencies to unlock, uh, you know, both the economies in Africa and in uh, less eco economically developed countries. And that 
the point you just made up, it's an interesting one, because if you think about um, how uh, telecommunications has evolved, there are countries that actually went straight to mobile, didn't even bother with the kind of landlines and jumped the system. And, and in fact, are perhaps the you know, more uh, techno technologically savvy than some of the, the, the countries that have gone slowly through the system you know, from landline to, to mobiles. I'm thinking of um, you know, countries like Estonia, for example, um, uh, you know, in our own in our own EU. But I was actually I'm interested to know whether we see that this is a real possibility to helping unlock these economies. Um, I think it's a very interesting question. I, I, I think it's already started. I don't think there's any question. Um, you know, I, I, you, you mentioned uh, telecommunications. Um, I, I visit Morocco every year. It's, it's, it's uh, 14 kilometers away from us. Um, and I saw firsthand the skipping of the landline and going straight from the very old, where nobody had a line, to now have everybody having mobiles. I think something similar will happen uh, with this, uh, and I think it's already happening in Africa, it's already happening in, in like, if you go to Argentina, if you go to Uruguay, if you go to Chile, many of them who haven't been able to get the traditional bank uh, are using uh, uh, cryptos, Bitcoin, and, and whatever they can, they can use on their, on their wallets or on their telephones. I think it's already happening, I think it'll continue to happen, uh, and I think that's one of the good, the good news stories about the use of this technology, it's helping to bank the unbanked. I think so as well. I mean, the financial inclusion, and that is another one of our <laughs> our challenges, uh, perhaps less directly with, with crypto, but with the digital euro is uh, the accessibility. I mean, how can you ensure that the accessibility directive is, is taken into account because this is a public sector European institutions uh, initiative. So uh, both in general, um, with this kind of possibility for people to have their own wallets with them. And then more specifically for the central bank digital currencies. I mean, very definitely one of the issues should also always be the, uh, both the uh, inclusiveness and the ensuring that uh, as many people as possible have access to the services and make it much easier to be a part of the active economy or to start your own business. I fully agree. Um, I think uh, I agree with the, with the, what Albert has to say about you know the future of, of uh, cashless. I, I think I think the, the trend is there, but I, I don't see it as a, as a complete uh, you know end of cashless as we know it. I, I, I don't think th there is still preference of, of, uh, of various stakeholders to to keep the cash, uh, but obviously it's it's limiting. But I think uh, maybe we should we should uh, make a distinction here, be, be, uh, you know, between between the cashless. And and uh, and the digital currency or, or crypto assets because this this could be two different phenomena. Uh, phenomena. The the cashless as you know, not using cash in order to carry out the tr the transaction, you know, the, the regular payments, but still you know on the basis of of the currencies as we know them. Uh, you know, so we, we're just not uh, using the physical representations, just pence and coins, but we we're still using the the, the traditional currencies. You know. Uh, electronically, but I think uh, there's a, there's a different uh, uh, level of, of um, discussion when we say that you know there will be digital currencies uh, also uh, in, in in play because there can be also well they do not have to be uh, all of them uh, issued by central banks and this is this is this is what we what we see currently. I, I totally agree with the, with the aspect of, of financial inclusion and also for countries. Um, we, we heard recently, a couple of years ago, the initiative of Venezuelan uh, government to, to introduce their petro currency uh, as a crypto asset, which would sort of uh, help people to avoid the hyperinflation of, of, uh, of the regular currency. This could be also also way out, and, I, and we see a number of countries across the world that um, the, the digital digital currencies can can help to, to solve this. Uh, but also, uh, you know, having Having uh, heard everything that was said uh, about the financial, uh, the, the financial inclusions in, in the countries uh, across Africa, for example, Latin America, there is there is one risk that still may be um, uh, may be raised, and that that is that obviously there there is very low um, uh, credibility at some point, or low trust from from people to some of the local currencies. Uh, if 
there is uh, not a um, accessible uh, representation in terms of digital currencies accepted worldwide. Uh, the, the privately run initiatives, and it was mentioned here, uh, uh, the, the, the initiative of DN, which can reach out up to 3 billion of, of, uh, of users um, uh, almost instantly. This could be uh, for, uh, for many uh, of, of companies or customers across those areas, also one of the, uh, one of the potential uh, alternatives how how to um, how to use uh, the, the the new types of, of digital currencies and those uh, you know would potentially have uh, much lower control um, than 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 we expect uh, for example the, you know from from digital central bank currencies so there may be a risk in in in, in a very fast uh, digitalization uh, across across some of the areas because because of the fast acceptance of, of some of the uh, some of the initiatives that or some of the some of the projects that may have not be uh, fully fully regulated and and potentially risk we are running for it. thank you um, well, we're kind of running out of time. Um, I, I didn't actually really uh, tackle much, many of the questions on blockchain. So for those of you who have asked questions on blockchain, I apologies that uh, we haven't been able to answer uh, really many of them. But actually, I was just thinking maybe in the uh, four minutes remaining, um, I just would love to have um, uh, the speaker's views on how we can uh, embed blockchain into more of our systems we have one question, for example, from Adrian, who is an entrepreneur, I believe, who asks whether um, the commission, for example, has thought about the regulated framework around, around these you know, providing services. And the example uh, Adrian's given is, is public notary services and whether you can kind of avoid the middleman. But of course, a lot of the, the possibilities of blockchain mean, would mean that you, you would uh, avoid that middle layer. So it would be interesting to know from each of your perspectives, uh, what is your thinking around promoting and, 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 and helping uh, you know, um, uh, the supply chain to implement blockchain? Maybe I'll start with you, Pateres, as that was a question directly for the commission first. Well, gladly. I mean, we talked about our legislative initiatives today, the regulatory sandbox, which is a way to apply existing legislation and then building ourselves. And in fact, we have audit document certification as one of our use cases that we're rolling out on the EBSI. I mean, at this time for many reasons, many of which you could, you could imagine. I mean, there is not a mandate or a demand to replace notarization, which is a institution prominent in the systems of, of many of our, of our member states. But pilot, interestingly, which we didn't talk about a lot, the mm -hmm. second uh, legislative proposal of the uh, digital finance package allows the uh, regulator, the supervisor, to uh, dispense with the requirement for a centralized securities depository. So actually eliminating, it's a regulatory sandbox plus, eliminating a required uh, legislative element because the blockchain doesn't need it. So these possibilities are being more than looked at. They're in uh, the parliament and the council right now for adoption and then for, for implementation in the uh, hopefully fairly near future. Indeed, and I'm glad that Petra has mentioned it because I think that uh, that is that is very important uh, initiative in this regard, and, and it's true that we were not mentioning it uh, too, too too often today. But uh, exactly the, the the proposal for for the DLT, DLT pilot regime uh, is actually a step forward in order to to see what what are actually possible practical applications of, of blockchain technology and what can what can be done. Uh, because I think in terms of uh, Technological usability, um, we can we can see uh, many various use cases, uh, but uh, at the same time we have to see uh, how how that actually fits uh, the, the the existing legislative framework. And I, and I can imagine that uh, in terms of of um, um, validating uh, use of technology, which which would uh, maybe the shortcut uh, some of some of the processes uh, in terms of uh, public decision making, for instance, but not only uh, would, would require a, a deep a change also in, in the in the legal framework as it, as it is done, or at least to to find 
a good equivalence level so that we can actually say that you know those are actually uh, equivalent ways of, of, of doing uh, same thing so I think that is that is important but uh, I, I, I really believe that um, uh, if, if we adopt uh, the DOT power regime um, uh, timely and, and there are already use cases that uh, may fall into this regime that would be one, one step forward uh, in this regard in order to actually test not only the, the techni technological possibilities but also to test the, the legal possibilities of, of uh, how uh, blockchain and other technologies can, can be applied. And I think this is, this, is, uh, this is a very good initiative in this regard. Thank you, Albert. I don't know if you have anything, a fi quick final word, because we're just out of time. Look, I think um, when we introduced the regulatory framework at the same time, we got the university to start doing training courses on blockchain to try and encourage adoption. Government itself is, is going to be using blockchain in the delivery of some of our own services. So in our own very small little way, we're doing our bit to, to increase knowledge, awareness, adoption, um, and, and I hope we lead to more and more use of this uh, incredible technology. And um, you know, that's a perfect end, knowledge, to increase knowledge, awareness uh, 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 for the adoption, I think is, uh, is a very good way to end this fascinating subject. Thank you so much to my speakers, Andre Pateras, to Albert, to Dan, and to the whole team at the, at the chamber for this excellent event. Um, I think it could have gone on for another hour. It was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for your time. Tune in to our next events. I'm sure we'll have more to say on this in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Bye, everybody. Bye.